and welcome to Things We Said Today, a weekly Beatles radio show where we discuss all things related to the Beatles, the Beatles as a group, Beatles as solo artists, news about them, things they're up to, you name it. Uh, I'm Alan Cozen, and I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, uh, Steve Marinucci, who you know from his Beatles Examiner columns and all sorts of other Examiner columns on the internet. Al Sussman, who contributes to Beatle Fan, has been a contributor from the very start of the magazine. Ken Michaels, who you know from his radio show, Every Little Thing, and his website, kenmichaelsradio.com. And we're joined by one of our regular guest co-hosts, Darren DeVivo from WFUV-FM in the New York area. Tonight, we're going to be discussing our favorite Beatles solo albums, or some of our favorite Beatles solo albums. Uh, Once we began talking about it, we realized that with the five of us, there's no way we could do all of them in an hour. So tonight we'll discuss two. We'll discuss our favorite John Lennon solo albums and our favorite Ringo Starr solo albums each. But uh, first, I think we wanted to talk about the uh, the recent passing of Dennis Ferrante. Um, and Ken Michaels interviewed him a few times and I think probably has the most to say about him. Dennis was uh, an engineer on, I think, five of John Lennon's solo albums and a, a great many other artists, too. So, um, Ken, what do you think? Well, it's a very sad time for me because I came to know Dennis back in the 80s when I was doing my Beatles radio program on WDHA in New Jersey. And he was a guest on my show. I don't recall how I first came to know him. It must have been through May Pang, because the two of them are very close friends. And um, he was an amazing person. I've had him, I had him on my show on WDHA at least two times. And in fact, the very last show I ever did on WDHA was a show with Dennis and May Pang together. And the radio station threw a party for me. Uh, and because it was my 10th anniversary then, and Dennis and May both attended that show. He's, he was a good friend to me all these years, and he was a fascinating person to interview. He, like you said, Alan, he engineered John Lennon's solo albums in the 70s. He talked about how all that happened. He was a very outspoken person about John and about Yoko as well. Um, he kind of surprised me a bit at how outspoken and candid he was on the air. It kind of, uh, it startled me because I never had a guest like that on the air that was so open uh, and just said what he felt like. He was a real straight shooter. And I think that a lot of people will miss him for so many reasons. But the fact that he was so honest in his opinions about everything that he shared, that you really came to know him very well. And he had very definite opinions, not just about John and Yoko, but about the music industry. And we shared all that together through the years so many great memories I have of him. He was uh, a guest at Charles Rosnay's uh, Beatle convention called Beat Expo in Connecticut back in 2009. He also was a part of um, Danbury Fields Forever, which is the uh, one or two day festival that happens in, in Danbury, Connecticut. Every single year he performed last year there as a special guest. He started out his career as a rock and roll singer. He had rock bands in the 60s and he came to do engineering work. For John, beginning with the Imagine album, and he worked with so many different people, and and I'm still learning so much stuff about him now. So many people he's worked with, and a diverse array of artists. And Steve wrote uh, several articles uh, now on the passing uh, of Dennis, and you'd be surprised all the people that he came to work with as an engineer. Everybody from not only John but Waylon Jennings and Harry Nilsson, uh, Alice Cooper. Uh, Hall and Oates, The Who he worked with, The Clash, Duke Ellington, uh, Wynton Marsalis, Elvis Presley. I'm pretty sure he remastered some of Elvis's, uh, catalog albums. Um, even, I didn't know this, the 1910 Fruit Gum Company. Uh, so he, he worked with a lot of people. Oh, the Raspberries. Um, in fact, I do recall several years ago when the Raspberries reunited, and they did a couple of shows in New York City. One year they did it, well, the first year was at B.B. King's in New York City, and then I think it was the following year at the Highline Ballroom in New York City. And I went to uh, both shows, and I know 
that the one at B.B. King's, Dennis was the engineer for that show. So he engineered the Raspberries records, and I guess the loyalty was still there. They wanted him to work on the live show when they reunited. So that tells you something right there. Mm -hmm. He was just so well-respected as an engineer in the business. And, um, you know, this I saw him a month ago. He did a concert at the Cutting Room in New York City where he was backed up by uh, Steve Holly on drums and Gary Van Syok from Elephant's Memory on bass, and Jimmy Mack, a great guitar player. These are all people that in the last few years have all been working together through various musicians, especially Jeff Slate, who we've come to know, who writes for Beatle Fan and so many publications. And Jeff Slate um, recorded an album called Birds of Paradox a couple of years ago, and two of the members of Elephant's Memory are on the album, and two of the members of Wings are on the album, and Dennis engineered that. So um, they all kind of, you know, know each other, have worked with each other the last few years. They've all gotten together in various formations and performed. And, um, and Dennis was a great singer. He, he talked to me about harmonizing with John Lennon in the studio when they were rehearsing. Mm. And uh, what a great thrill that was. And he's got so, he had so many interesting stories to tell. And he was a great storyteller. And, um, you know, I'm definitely going to miss him, as will so many people. Everyone that I know who has worked with Dennis and have, has known Dennis as a friend was so touched by him that uh, he is a tremendous loss. And uh, I really feel that I came to know him very well Ken, just because of his outgoing personality and, and all. Mm -hmm. There's also one fact. He won a Grammy in 1999 uh, for Best Historical mm -hmm. Album for uh, – the Duke Ellington Centennial Edition complete RCA Victor recordings. Mm -hmm. So that's also, and that, that, uh, the Recording Academy issued a statement yesterday, um, you know, to pay tribute to him. So, but that's all, that's uh, also important to, uh, to mention that too. Ken, how old was uh, Dennis? And I understand he had some heart problems and that's uh, what he passed away from. Well, all the reports that I've, that I've read, didn't give his age, but I would guess because he started working on the Imagine album early 20s, so you'd have to figure probably around 65. And yes, he did have heart problems, and yes. there was a, a benefit concert um, at the Highline Ballroom several years ago to raise money so that he can get a heart transplant. And I know that in, in uh, just recently, he was still on a waiting list for it. Mm -hmm. So, And the thing about him, I mean... He was operating on 20% capacity with his heart. Mm -hmm. Wow. And even still, he was determined to keep on living and keep on working. And, you know, he started out, like I said, being a rock and roll singer. And that, and that he loved doing. He loved especially a lot of the great classic rock and roll of the 60s. And when you saw him at the cutting room, he was singing all the songs that he loved. You know, Mustang Sally was like, it's, it was almost like his signature song. Anytime there was a party and Dennis would sing, He'd have to do Mustang Sally. So uh, he did all kinds of stuff. In fact, a lot of it's online on YouTube uh, from that concert. So, Especially Don't Let the Sun Catch You Crying, the Jerry and the Pacemaker song, which <laughs> he did so well. Yeah. So. so, Ken, are you going to include some excerpts from your interviews on your website during the week, or do you, you have something planned uh, as a tribute? Uh, yes, I do. Actually, on my live broadcast, which is on Wednesday on the 10th, which is going to be too late as this is being posted, I'm going to play some of the clips of my last interview with him, which was at Beat Expo in Connecticut. Uh, that was in 2009. And I'm also going to place those clips on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And there's a page that I have on there because I have so many interviews now on my website. It's on the third page of my interviews. It's called Interviews Page 3, if you want to look for it. Okay. And I will be digging up my older interviews. I mean, I haven't heard that last show at WDHA since it was broadcast, and we're talking 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be fascinating for me to listen back to that, especially to have Dennis and May Pang together. So uh, at some point very soon, I'm going to be posting that as well. Okay. So on to the... Main subject. Uh, shall we start with John, seeing as he was in the group first and all? <laughs> <laughs> um, seeing seeing as, it, as it was his band. <laughs> that's it. Okay. All right. So um, who wants to start? 
Okay. Well, my uh, my favorite John album has to be uh, Plastic Ono Band because I wore that sucker out in the vinyl version. I absolutely loved that album. I, I mean, I still do. It's I think it's his, far and away his best album. Um, it's powerful. You know, forget the forget the Yanoff, you know, influence. But uh, I mean, that's just just an amazing album. It really, really is. Um, and and for people who haven't discovered it or to shy away from Yoko music, the Yoko Plastic Ono Band album that was released at the same time is also amazing. I wouldn't necessarily put it up with John's, but it's it's really uh, a very uh, listenable as opposed to some of her later albums. But um, but the John Lennon, I mean, the, the Lennon album is just is fantastic, starting with Mother. Um, I found out working class heroes. I mean, there were so many things he, you know, he, uh, he cussed on that album and gave radio programmers fits. I remember, I think, you know, you've, I, I, you, there've been outtakes floating around out there of, I remember that just sound absolutely amazing, but the song itself is fantastic. The whole, I mean, the whole album is just, is just absolutely incredible. Uh, God is, uh, it's just stunning, um, and and my mommy's dead is uh, is you know is just very very moody. I mean, it's just, it creates a wonderful mood. The whole album is just is a ma- masterpiece. It really is. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, Al. Okay, well, um, I'll make the, make this relatively short and sweet because I talked about this album a few weeks ago, uh, and I. Should be consistent. We did a show on mind games relatively recently. And to me, yes, um, you know, John Lennon Plastic Ono Band is an absolute classic album. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it was trailblazing and it's bare bones approach, uh, with all the primal scream influence and all. Uh, and it, and it, you know, it was a uh, trailblazer in kind of uh, pointing the way toward uh, what the grunge groups would be doing about 20 years hence, um, groups like Nirvana and and, uh, and such. But uh, and then Imagine trod some of the same ground, but with more of a sheen over it, uh, but also pointed uh, the way toward the, the more uh, social commentary material that John will be doing shortly. But for me, the most consistently satisfying album and the most and really me, the musically most consistent album in his post Beatles catalog uh, is Mind Games. Mm-hmm. You know, there are uh, there are so many just wonderful songs on there. Things like You Are Here and One Day at a Time and um, Intuition. And there's some great rock and roll on there as well. So uh, mm-hmm. it, it really it shows the, the best elements of John's post-Beatles work. And again, it's the most consistent of, of those, uh, un- is unfortunately a uh, rather small post-Beatles uh Post Beatles catalog, but that's but Mind Games is mine is my pick. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, Darren. Alrighty. Um, well, <laughs> I'm going to go with uh, Walls and Bridges mm. a, as my pick, and a lot of the same reasons that uh, Al just gave for Mind Games, I uh, pretty much echo. Uh, I've always looked at John Lennon Plastic Ono Band as uh, Probably John's most important post Beatles album, but it is, uh, in some respects, maybe to some ears, it's, uh, it's a more difficult listen. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it also was the type of album that you don't necessarily put on at a party. Uh, <laughs> it's the type of album mm. that, that really demands a certain mood. Uh, it almost, in my book, um, it's kind of set apart. That's, in my, my mind, uh, his most uh, important work. Uh, but when you're talking uh, the combination of lyrics and uh, music and production, 
for some reason, and I don't exactly uh, know what it is, I've always gravitated a little more towards walls and bridges. It's just um, I, I connect more with the songs than I do, say, with some of Imagine. I kind of always thought of Imagine, Mind Games, and Walls and Bridges to be very, very similar albums. It, it's got the lyrical bite. But it's got the pop uh, sensibilities, and uh, production-wise, they're sort of the same difference. But for whatever reason, for tastes, I appear. Uh, uh, it's it's the album that I uh, that I gravitate towards is is Walls and Bridges. Now, perhaps, you know, it was the not counting rock and roll. It was the last album that John did as I approached. Uh, but I was nine years old when it came out, so it was maybe the first album where I really heard more than one or two songs from. It could have been the very uh, famous interview that Dennis Elsis did mm -hmm. with John Lennon on WNEWFM uh -huh. uh, in September of 74, and John was there to promote Walls and Bridges. Right. And uh, that mm -hmm. interview, um, even though I work with Dennis at WFUV, uh, I haven't heard that interview from beginning to end since I know him personally, but before I knew him, I heard it a bunch of times in its entirety on the radio and always loved that interview, and maybe that's the reason why, for my tastes, uh, I grew to be very fond of Walls and Bridges, and, um, you know, that's, that's just the record that, uh, for my tastes, I gravitate to, but if you asked me, tell me the essential, most important work I do acknowledge that it is John Lennon Plastic Ono Band, but not the mm -hmm. first album that I'd go for if you told me, take one to a desert island or play me your favorite one right now. That's mm -hmm. Walls and Bridges. Okay. Okay, so, so far we have nothing like a consensus here. Uh, <laughs> Ken? Well, I'm going to go with Mind Games. Uh, so Al and I are in agreement. Mm -hmm. And I agree with a lot of what you guys have been saying, and certainly Plastic Ono Band is a masterpiece. It should be regarded as such. But it is a tough listen, mm. and while I respect the songs in there and how personal and just how how uh, bare bones the production was and how much it was a forerunner to uh, punk rock or grunge rock, as Al was saying, sometimes my favorite work is not the most groundbreaking. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to fall into that category. If uh, an album is made up of just really strong songs, and I like the songs the way they are, then it stands on its own on that level. Mm -hmm. And Mind Games is one of those albums where I love every single song. <laughs> every song is strong. The melodies are strong. Um, Out the Blue, as Al was saying, that's one of the greatest love songs I think John has done in his solo career. Mm -hmm. You Are Here, mm -hmm. One Day at a Time. I love the bluesiness of I See Masen. I think the title track to Mind Games is one of the greatest solo Beatles singles, period. Mm -hmm. It's not only just a great song, but it's produced so well. And I think we even said when we were talking about Mind Games that, that the title track is kind of Phil Spector-ish. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it's kind of ironic, um, in going over that last interview that I did with Dennis Ferrante. I asked him what his proudest moment was working with John, a, a specific song or album. And he said the song Mind Games. He just loved the way that the song was finished, the whole production behind it. What is that? It's a truck uh, <laughs> coming through the room. Yeah. That was Al playing with so. his rocket launcher. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the production behind that song is fantastic, and uh, Dennis was talking about how so much was built around the, those three notes, the da 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 you know, over and over again, and he really loved it. Like It was like a mantra mm -hmm. throughout the song. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was very proud of that song in terms of the composition and in terms of the production behind it. There's just so many great moments throughout uh, Mind Games. I've always loved Intuition. I thought that could possibly have been a single. It does have kind of a circus atmosphere. I think I mentioned this before, like Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite. Mm -hmm. I Know I Know is one of my favorite songs from John's solo career. It's not only a great song, but I love the arrangement. And the bass playing on there from Gordon Edwards really added a lot to that song. You Are Here is amazing. I know uh, Darren loves Meat City because he brought that up in a previous show. It's a great rock song right there. You know, all throughout, song by song. 
uh, when we were talking about the Tug of War album and Tom Franjone was with us and he said that particular album, he would not fast forward any song. He would listen to every song. It, there's no, there's no song he didn't like. And that's how Mind Games is for me. Granted, there's very few songs in John's solo career that I didn't care for. But if you're talking about from start to finish, you know, Mind Games, I love every single song on there. And I love every song on Plastic on Old Band as well, but it is a tough listen. It's not one that I can put on on a regular basis, yeah. you know, and imagine I love every song except I don't want to be a soldier. Right. So, uh, but yet, you know, the other nine songs I love passionately. So I'm, I certainly wouldn't in any way uh, be that critical of imagine. And most of John's material on some time in New York City, I thought was really great. Some of Yoko's I liked a lot, but I couldn't look at that the same way as I would a full John Lennon album. And I love Walls and Bridges, too. I think the production on Walls and Bridges was superb, better produced than Mind Games. But um, as, as far as, you know, song per song, I think that uh, that Mind Games really stands out. And, and what I said about Sometime in New York City, you could apply to Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey, sure. <laughs> since they were half and half, John and Yoko. So if you're talking about every song being a winner, for me, Mind Games is just that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, so we've gone from not having a consensus to 50% of you for liking Mind Games, which when we talked about it a few weeks ago, we sort of were talking about how it's often a neglected album. Uh, yeah. A lot of people to sort of take it for granted, don't bother with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting. So I guess that brings us to me. Yes. Um, when we were talking about doing this, we, uh, as a, a ground rule, we sort of ruled out live albums and so that means of course that life with the lions couldn't really be considered because half of it is live cambridge 1969 so uh yeah but i have to say among john's albums it really is a difficult choice and you know like we've we've all talked about well all four of you i think talked about other albums that you could have picked and why uh you know i had limited it to a choice between Plastic Ono Band and Double Fantasy. And since Plastic Ono Band has had its moment, uh, tonight I'll go with Double Fantasy. You know, Plastic Ono Band, I, I love for all the reasons that, that you guys have said, and the songs are, are incredible. And, uh, you know, plus as, the, as John's first post Beatles album, not counting, I guess, the live piece, in Toronto and, and, and Life with the Lions and Two Virgins, you know, it, it, it kind of opened up a, a window into what he was thinking about the Beatles, for instance, in the song God, you know, and, and other stuff. Uh, but Double Fantasy, uh, in a way, it, it has a similar, not really a similar feeling musically in any way, but again, you know, we hadn't heard from John in five years and we're now, you know, with this album comes out and we suddenly get to hear what's on his mind. And it's a little peculiar in that what's on his mind is family, Yoko, Sean, you know, stuff like that, but, but other things too. And, uh, he was 40 years old, so it's not that unusual that these should be his concerns. Um, but there are things like watching the wheels, which, you know, I think kind of sums up what, you know, at least what, what he was presenting as what he was doing for the five years. And, uh, and, and, and it's very Beatlesque. I mean, watching the wheels to me sounds like it could be on the White Album. You know, it's it's got that kind of feeling. Um, starting Over, I think, is a, a great rocker, um, very much in the sort of classic vein that, you know, we've all heard the outtakes where he you know, talks about it being Elvis Orbison. You know, it's, it's definitely true. I love Yoko's stuff from this album, too. I mean, you, you know, these are, she's doing really conventional songs, except they're not that conventional, you know, kiss, 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 <laughs> right. you know, but, but they're songs in a way that, um, more conservative listeners would recognize as being songs with verses and choruses and, and the whole thing. And, you know, and she's got some, you know, some of the, uh, vocal histrionics that we knew from very early on, but those, those don't outweigh the songs. Um, and, you know, they're almost like sort of quirky 
weird little instrumental breaks, <laughs> you know, um, mm. you know, the band is really cooking and, uh, you know, I don't know. There are a lot of, you know, in, in, in certain of the more recent Lennon biographies, there's this sense that all of this was really just, a a facade. It has nothing to do with what John and Yoko were really up to and the, and the whole mm-hmm. thing. And I, I don't really care. You know what? It's mm-hmm. a good story. And, you know, John is what John would say in interviews as well. You know, I don't want to write about Ziggy Stardust. I want to do, uh, you know, I want to do what we're doing. Now, if, as it turns out, this world that he's presenting us is also semi fictional, you know, uh, that's fine. <laughs> Nothing I can do about it. There's somebody <laughs> pot putting around the parking lot here. Mm. Yes, a non-Yoko fan getting on his motorcycle right. and getting away. <laughs> um, but, you know, and also in a way, um, I thought of uh, as a, a way of looking at this, too, is that Double Fantasy is really, at this point, three albums. So even if John uh, is only half of it, you know, it really is also Milk and Honey. I mean, those are from the same sessions, and they were – planning a follow-up and you know whether that would have been the follow-up who knows because you know a lot of times at the end of a session you have six or eight songs left over but when you go in for your next session you may or may not pick those up Mm -hmm. um in this case Mm -hmm. they didn't have much choice because this is what he left and uh and they wanted to get those things out um and a lot of those are 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 good songs too nobody told me is uh no reason that couldn't have been on on Double Fantasy and uh, right. Borrow Time. Uh, right. A lot of them are very poignant, you know, in, in with the wisdom of hindsight, you know, looking back on, on what happened. Borrow Time, Grow Old With Me, mm-hmm. all of that. And then the third uh, the third album is, of course, really just the first album, again, the, the remix version of Double Fantasy, which gives you the same material but with a very different kind of feeling, more stripped back. So, you know, that's what I'm thinking about those. But, you know, this is a, even though it's a very small catalog, it's really a great catalog. You know, there's, there's, mm. there's not much dross in there. And, um, so in a way it, it was kind of difficult to choose, but, um, that's what I went with. So shall we, uh, are we going to, are we going to argue these points or are we just going to go on to Ringo? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we argue them? <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think Double Actually, Fantasy is a good choice, um, you know, because really when it came out, I mean, it wasn't really – I think before – and Alan, uh, back uh, – I want to hear what you thought about this. But, you know, before it, before everything happened, obviously, I don't know that there was – I mean, there was some hype about the album, but I don't think the expectations were nearly as big as what happened, you know, for, obviously following John's death. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that, I don't know that the album would have gotten, uh, especially because of Yoko's stuff, would have gotten as much, um, praise had, uh, things not happened. I don't know. I, I, I does that, well, does that, the, uh, the first reviews mm-hmm. that came out, you know, in the mm-hmm. first, cause the album had been out about two weeks. Right. And the first reviews that came out actually gave Yoko higher marks. They felt that John was sort of, just kind of marking time, in effect, then wow. uh, people were kind of unimpressed. At least critics were kind mm-hmm. of unimpressed with uh, uh, with John's songs, feeling that they were too traditional, too perhaps perhaps too Beatle-like mm-hmm. um, as such, and gave higher marks to Yoko's material. Yeah. I remember that really yeah. well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I remember it being such an exciting time, really, because he had been quiet for five years and they'd taken out, you know, full page ads in the Times saying basically leave us alone. Or they they were a little nicer than that. But, uh, you Mm -hmm. know, uh, and now suddenly, you know, we're hearing he's starting to record. He's going to do something and, uh, you know, just waiting to hear what it was. I, I, I didn't find it disappointing at all. So. 
yeah, I thought it was very fresh, you know, even even if it was Beatley or old Rocky or whatever. Um, and, and the Yoko stuff, you know, I thought it was there was really a clear sense of dialogue in these songs, which is what they were after. You know, right. um, mm-hmm. they they seem to respond to each other. And I think that works really well as a as a concept for an album. I mean, it's more of a concept album than Sgt. Pepper is really, if you want to talk about concepts. But oh. uh, uh, I'm not saying it's a, I'm not saying it's a better album than Sgt. Pepper, but <laughs> I just mean in terms of the concept thing. And, and it was interesting, the comment you made about uh, about watching the wheels being kind of a Beatles esque song, something that might have come from the White Album, because I can remember that, you know, that night um, in the early morning hours, when, as especially the FM stations were devoting virtually all of their time to playing either John's solo music or Beatles uh, material, the song they seemed, that so many of them seemed to be going back to it was watching the wheels, mm-hmm. which, considering that it had only been out for two weeks, is is pretty remarkable mm-hmm. that it had made that mm-hmm. much of a uh, of an impression so quickly, and that uh, you know obviously the irony of you know the sentiments in the song, and then this un you know unfortunate uh, coda, right, um, right. Uh, you know, it, I suppose it made it sort of fitting, but it is. It, I thought it was very interesting that that it got so much airplay in those days, those first days after John's murder. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually thought that should have been the first single. Mm. You know, like I can see why they went with starting over because it, it kind of makes sense thematically for someone coming back after a five year hiatus to mm. release a single called sure. Just Starting Over, but. But I liked watching The Wheels as a song much better, you know. I would yeah. think that uh, something yeah. else about uh, Double Fantasy was the fact that, uh, you know, in the 70s, for an artist to go over five years without releasing an album mm-hmm. uh, was yeah. a long time. Yes. And uh, mm. the I remember the the buzz about there's going to be a new John Lennon album. Uh, and this, and that pre-internet age, what little mm. buzz you would that you'd get, uh, advanced buzz on something like that. Uh, I remember there being a, a great build-up to it, uh, which is now clouded, unfortunately, by the events of a few weeks after uh, release. Uh, mm-hmm. but the, uh, you know, there's something else that also maybe caused some critics to, to, to knock the album, for lack of a better word, was that it was a five-year build-up. Wait, and this is the first work he comes out with. Yeah. Perhaps it was in some, mm-hmm. each of some years, it was a little sense of a letdown. Now we could mm-hmm. revisit the album in a different way. Yeah. Uh, these years later and not look at it as, oh, it's the first thing he did in five years. And right. instead look at it as... You know, a, a body, a, a piece of work, uh, regardless of how long uh, it took to uh, to bring it out. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure I'd look at it as having taken five years to do. I mean, most of that time he was, so far no, no, as any no. of us knew, he was retired, sort of. You know. No, no. I, mm-hmm. I think I, you know what I was trying to say was that the the build up of you know, what's he going to do? What's what's this first album in, in so long? Because it was such a long time. Well, Today, it's it's not unusual for an artist to right. like, f- that five years go between albums that when the album finally did come out, because it actually was, those sessions kind of did happen pretty quickly, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. You know, the summer yeah. was already underway when uh, he got down to uh, recording in earnest. And by the fall, enough was finished to put Double fantasy out, but you know, with the buildup of waiting to see what John would do next, and double fantasy comes out, I'm sure some people thought it was a little underwhelming as a result of that. Mm. Well, so you know, if they wanted something really new and fresh and adventurous, why, why did they hate you know, two virgins and life and lions when they came out? You know, it's, he, <laughs> he sort of can't win here. You know, <laughs> or maybe they just wanted I, I, you know John doing punk. You know. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I kind of agree with you, Alan, about John's material. I think that every song that John did there could have been a single, you know, in, in my opinion. And I think Woman is one of the best songs he's ever done. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the greatest love songs ever, mm -hmm. you know, and very Beatlesque. And he even referred to it as being Beatlesque. Mm -hmm. But in particular, what I love most about Double Fantasy, apart from, I, I love the balance between the John and Yoko songs. Uh, you know, if, if you, if you're someone that is not going to go heavy into Yoko's catalog and you want to know, you know, probably her most mainstream, if you want to refer to that, her material, although I don't really consider Kiss, Kiss, Kiss mainstream, maybe for her <laughs> it is, mm -hmm. um, most people would, would go towards the stuff on Double Fantasy and find that much more, you know, acceptable than her, you know, wilder stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, the, but I love the production on Double Fantasy. I don't think there's enough attention given to how well that album was produced. It was really, it has a very crisp sound to it. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of bite to it. I love the sound of, of cleanup time in particular. The arrangements on, on the album were great. The horns on cleanup time. But I think, you know, for a lot of people who wanted to see some kind of progress in John's music, they were kind of disappointed because many of the songs sounded like something he had done prior. And when I heard Watching the Wheels and I heard those opening piano chords, I immediately thought of Imagine as a mm -hmm. song. I wasn't really thinking of the White Album, mm -hmm. but uh, I immediately thought about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're always going to have that kind of situation where a certain new song that you hear will remind you of something from the past. And uh, I think a number of the songs on Double Fantasy are just that. Mm -hmm. But um, they're still great songs. Yeah, you know, I'm lo I'm losing you has so much bite to it. I love that, and I love the version with Cheap Trick too. Mm -hmm. But uh, the one uh, the one on Double Fantasy was just incredible, and it got a lot of airplay as I remember on uh, on rock stations, even though it wasn't a single. So um, yeah, Double Fantasy was definitely a, a brilliant album, and it and you have to give a lot of the credit to Yoko and the musicians and and Jack Douglas as a producer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I was going to say for five years off, uh, it was uh, it was quite well done. You have to you know give him a lot of credit for that. Yeah. Got a got a rhetorical question. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Now we I think we can pretty much <laughs> obviously we know why sometime in New York City didn't get any calls on here, and probably <laughs> the same for rock and roll. But I noticed that Imagine didn't get. Uh, didn't yeah, get a vote from any of us. That's right. His most popular album. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Well, is it really? I think so. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, I imagine is his most well known. It's his signature solo song. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd call it his most popular one. Maybe. I mean, Walls and Bridges certainly when it came out was did re really well. Oh. Got a lot of airplay on rock stations and not just the singles. Mm -hmm. So um, it's tough to say. But imagine, I, I cherish that album. It's just that it's a near perfect album. If I Don't Want to Be a Soldier <laughs> right. was not on there and there was another song that I liked, yeah. it could very well have ended up number one. Uh. Um, so, you know, in John Lennon's solo career, there's only two songs I can think of off the top of my head that I didn't care for. So I think that's a pretty powerful catalog right there. Mm hmm. So we shouldn't give short shrift to Ringo, and the clock is ticking away. So should we do it in the same order? Should we start with Steve? Sure. Why not? Okay. Uh, my my choice for Ringo is why not. Speaking of why not, uh, I'm I'm a, a little prejudiced because I got to see I got to see a couple of the promotional appearances close up, including the the Grammy um, uh, appearance. And um, but I really like that album. I, I in fact I remember telling um, Edgar Winter I, I said you guys really need to to put uh, fill in the blanks in the in your set and they and they didn't. <laughs> but I think that's that's a, a wonderful song and that would have been a great uh, live song to do. But there are so many others. Of course, uh, Walk with You, uh, even without Paul McCartney, is fantastic. You know, Peace Dream, Peace Dream is is good. Why not is good. I even like. I don't think anybody else likes "Who's Your Daddy" except me, but I think I, I, I like it. Do you really? Because I, I, yeah. I, I think that's a great song. Uh, uh, I like the way he and Josh Stone uh, went back and forth on that. I thought that was that was wonderful. Um, I just I, I just wish there was more of Ringo in that song, vocally. Mm, mm. I mean, Josh 
does most of the vocals. Right. Yeah, but I, I I like that song. So, I mean, I I I think why not holds up really really well. Um, even if it's not, uh, you know, one of the earlier albums. I know somebody will. Pro- I know you got some of you guys will probably pick the earlier albums, but why not? Uh, I had that. Uh, I don't have it on my phone now because I don't have the space. But um, I had that on my phone for quite a while, and uh, I listened to it a lot. I really really like it. So here we go. Okay. Um, Al, I think, was next, right? Uh, I guess so. Uh, I'm going to go with an album that was released within just a few weeks of Mind Games. Mm. And that is probably the, the I, would, I would imagine, the consensus vote here. And that's Ringo. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ringo's first uh, mainstream pop album. It's such a it's such a wonderful collection of songs. Uh, you know, I you know uh, went back and forth through the catalog, uh, even albums like Time Takes Time from '92 and and uh, Ringo Rama from the uh, the the Mark Hudson era. But you just you know when you go right the right to the heart of it, the the Ringo album. Is is just so good, uh, just such a great collection of songs. It's also the uh, the only time in the in the lifetimes of John Lennon and George Harrison that all four Beatles um, appeared on the same record after after the Beatles after the breakup. Uh, but also, you know, it yielded uh, two. Uh, correct me, Ken, if I'm wrong. Two number one singles, right? That's right. Photogra- photograph. photograph and your and mm. his uh, cover of of your sixteen, uh, right? Uh, plus sunshine life for me with uh, virtually the entire band, the band, uh, plus mm-hmm. David Bromberg, uh, you know, uh, photograph, which you know is arguably perhaps the single greatest track of Ringo's entire post Beatles career. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh my my, which was also a top a top ten single, and which <laughs> which Ringo is had been, was almost having to be dragged into performing with the All Star Band and Six O'clock, you know Paul McCartney's uh, contribution to uh, the album that and the um, was it the kazoo or a comb that he was playing on your six on your sixteen Ken. <laughs> I think it's a kazoo. Okay, yeah, I've always thought it was a kazoo. But besides that, Six O'Clock is just a (laughs) wonderful, wonderful song. And really, right down the line, it's just every track has something going for it. So even though there are other albums in Ringo's canon, which, uh, you know, which have a lot going for them, to me, this is the one. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. I mean that's that that I would imagine actually most people feel to some degree whether or not that was their choice. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, yeah. for, for all the reasons you said. I mean, those those songs are uh, he he really sort of hit some sort of a uh, a nerve there, you know. Yes. Um, uh, so, Darren. Well, uh, I got to go with Ringo. Also, I think that uh, you know amongst my favorite albums. Uh, it's Ringo, it's uh, Ringo Rama, and uh, uh, I've always liked Time Takes Time, uh, but perhaps it's because it, um, perhaps it's because it's closest to the Beatles era, time-wise, uh, coming just a few years after the band's breakup, perhaps because the other members of the band uh, appear on the album. I think the hit singles from that are so strong. The hit singles alone, I think, really put the album over the top. I'll find myself grabbing for Ringo before I will Ringo Rama or Time Takes Time, Choose Love, Vertical Man, the other albums that I feel are uh, amongst Ringo's best. Really, I mean, Photograph, you pointed out, Al, is Mm -hmm. I think Photograph and It Don't Come Easy are two of the best A-sides by uh, the four of them combined, mm-hmm. uh, and Photograph would have made uh, a, a great Beatles song. And Oh My My has always been a favorite of mine. Uh, I remember all of those tunes getting played uh, a lot on WABC when I was a kid. 
nice. uh, listening to AM radio. So perhaps it's the one that I've been with the longest, and perhaps it's because it comes from that earlier or Apple period that I'll gravitate to Ringo first. But in, in, in the case of Ringo, maybe what I should do is say, Ringo's my pick, and uh, in parentheses, honorable mention, uh, let's go with Ringo Rama. But, uh, you know, for many of the same reasons of what Al said, uh, Ringo's my pick uh, from 73. Mm-hmm. Okay. Ken? Well, all I could say is regarding what Darren said, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I'm going to have to go with Ringo as well, and I'm kind of surprised. Uh, you know, Darren, the other albums that you picked were my favorites too, Time Takes Time, the three albums with Mark Hudson, Vertical Man, Ringo Rama, and Choose Love. They would be way up the chain for Ringo, but... When you go song by song, the 10 songs on the Ringo album are really just superb. Yeah. And it isn't just the fact that the other Beatles are on it. You know, I mean, a lot of people point to that fact. It's the, it's the fact that the songs are strong and the performances are strong as well. I mean, I love I'm the Greatest. It's, a, it's the perfect song for Ringo to sing. But John also wrote Cooking in the Kitchen of Love for Ringo, and that was not a good song oh, as far right. as I'm concerned. Yeah. So it's just the fact that the material was also strong as well. And Photograph, definitely. I echo your words there, Darren. It could very well be, and we should do a show on this, uh, I could rate that the best solo Beatles single, period. Oh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, a great, it's a great song itself, and the production is just absolutely perfect for Ringo. Although I do recall, yeah, it was, it was Ringo that said it to me. Um, in, in the interview that I just uh, did with him, that Richard Perry kind of copied the arrangement that George Harrison was doing for it. But um, the, the actual recording of Photograph is just so absolutely perfect and wonderful and every superlative that you can give to that song. I mean, it, it's uh, as much as I love it, Don't Come Easy, and I think that's a great song. Uh, Photograph is, is a definite classic. Um, and also... The songs that the the songs that didn't have the Beatles on them are wonderful. Have you seen my baby, which Randy Newman wrote? I mean, that's a really fine recording right there. Mm-hmm. I love the the songs he wrote with Vinnie Poncia, like Oh My My, which was a number five hit. Uh, Devil Woman. A lot of people point to that as being a really good rocker. Um, George Harrison. You, you, all the Beatles, you got to give a lot of credit to on the album. Because George Harrison did so much, he was more involved than anybody else on this album. Sunshine Life for me is just a great hoedown song. And, uh, you know, I love the fact that you can hear George's background vocals in that one. It's a really fun song to, to listen to. And I especially think, and no one has mentioned this, that You and Me, Babe, is one of the greatest yeah. album closers ever. Uh-huh. Uh, I still keep wishing, and I know it'll never come true, that Ringo will, will close a concert with that. But it's, uh, it's so perfect a song to end an album with and giving all the credits to the people who are involved with the album. And the fact that George wrote that with Mal Evans. And I still don't know what exactly Mal contributed in the songwriting. And also, my favorite uh, Ringo song, along with Photograph, has to be Six O'Clock. Mm. Six O'Clock yeah. to me is just a great wonderful melodic pop song tailor made for Ringo I love the whole arrangement I like the longer version that came out um, you know everything about this album is just it's another perfect album right there and I would I wouldn't take anything away from the other albums that I mentioned but just for photograph alone you know you could put this album in as as the best of Ringo's albums so once you add in everything else I don't really see how another album can top the Ringo album as much as I love the other ones that I mentioned. Okay, um, I think I'm going to continue my tradition of competing for, with Steve for being the odd man out here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> uh, it's an East Coast, West Coast thing, maybe. It, it um, must be. I'm going to go with Time Takes Time. I love the Ringo album, and everything you guys said about it is true. But of his recent albums, I mean, actually, 
you know, people think that Ringo's catalog is um, perhaps worse than it is. I, for a while during this week, I was going to go with Stop and Smell the Roses, which I really like, too. Hmm. And that, would have been, that would have been really odd. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, there's some good stuff on that. And if you remember those videos that, uh, that you know, Paul was in and uh, Barbara and his, I mean, there, there were some interesting things. And, uh, uh, but, you know, and also it has, um, well, I think that's that one has Short of Fall, which, uh, you know, it has this, this sort of ancient Beatles cred. Uh, so uh, there, there was a lot of good stuff about it, I thought. Um, I, I realize it comes from, um, you know, perhaps not the best period uh, in his life. But um, I'm going with Time Takes Time because, um, you know, in, in a way, for the same reason as Double Fantasy, uh, it was sort of after a, a hiatus and you're wondering what he's going to do. And in his case, the hiatus was... Uh, less voluntary than John's. Mm. I mean, you know, Old Wave came out in Germany and Canada only right. and mm. sold nothing. And I think he couldn't get arrested in the record business for a while. Um, <laughs> he should have gone touring with Paul. <laughs> mm. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, he, he then went and cleaned up. And then went on tour with the first of the all-star bands. And then, you know, the first studio production that comes after that is Time Takes Time. And it shows, I think, a, a revigorated, reinvigorated Ringo. Um, the songs are generally pretty good all through. I mean, it's, they're not, they're not, I, I will admit, as memorable as Photograph and Six O'Clock and, and the others, but, you know, you know, things like Way to the World, I thought Way to the World was a, a great start. Um, don't Go Where the Road Don't Go, I think we're, you know, we're talking about what Ringo's got going on in his life. That's a, um, a strong statement. And uh, also, you know, some of the things that came out as B-sides, Everybody Wins, you know, wasn't amazing, but it was it was a good song. And also on the on the B side of Way to the World, he put out a version of Don't Be Cruel, which I right. thought was a nice touch. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. So I think it was, you know, basically a fun album, um, an album that, you know, again, was kind of autobiographical in the in the way that Double Fantasy was. And uh, I, I just found that it kind of made me feel that. You know, okay, Ringo, Ringo's, Ringo's career will have a second act or a third act, depending mm -hmm. how you count. And so, you know, I, I still have very fond feelings about that album and Vertical Man and, uh, you know, and some of the others. Not, not all of the more recent ones. I mean, you know, they got to sound a little the same after a while. And, uh, but I also, I also really still like that kind of Mark Hudson period, you know, uh, that was sort of the first part of his recent career. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the post Hudson things too. I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty good, but, um, I just like that period where also where he had the round heads. I mean, I, I, I realize this is a little bit after time takes time, but, uh, you know, those, those shows he did with them, I thought were pretty good. And, uh, and, and without it being the all stars, I, I, I felt it was a more cozy sort of band sound. Um, but time takes time again. I mean, that's, that I guess is, is my choice for this. Although I, I whether I would, pull that out before Ringo. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, this week I did. So there we are. So we're, we mostly are all for the Ringo album, except for me and Steve. And Steve's is why okay. not. And mine is time <laughs> takes time. So do we want to look at the reader mailbag, Ken? Uh, I suppose we could. Um, we've had some people writing in, regarding our most recent shows, one of which was, um, in fact, I should point out the name Michael Lynch, who not only uh, contributes our music theme here right. uh, for the show, but he's a regular listener, and he was a guest on our show, and it was just Steve and me. And uh, one of the things that he brought up regarding the show that we did on the Star Club recordings, because Alan and I were commenting about how the Beatles didn't do Love Me Do. Mm -hmm. 
considering the fact that it had already been released, it was their first single, and he brought up a very good point, Michael did, which I think was really an oversight on our part, which is that we only got, you know, uh, what is it, an hour to two hours of recorded material here. Mm. The Beatles performed for eight hours minus their breaks. They could have very easily have done Love Me Do sure. live. This was only part of what they did over the course of, you were saying, two two nights, right? Right, Alan? right, yeah. Um, I, I sort of thought we might have, we didn't touch on that aspect. I, I thought we might have with it, maybe with something else. But, um, but yeah, that is, that is a good point. Um, they must have played it at some point during that stay. Um, uh, yeah. And not okay. only that, but I, I would also bring up that they didn't perform Please Please Me. And even though it hadn't been released yet. It had been recorded. Consider the fact. Yeah. So, um, but they did perform Ask Me Why. And yet, Please Please Me was not part of these recordings, too. Yeah. So that's also, I don't want to call it unusual, because we don't know everything that they did in the course of one night. That would be fascinating to see. Mm -hmm. And we do have Mark Lewison's book, The Beatles Live, which which lists all the songs that he was able to research the Beatles performed live on uh, during certain years. Mm -hmm. But we don't know the set list for an entire night, which would be fascinating to find out. Right. Good point. I, won I wonder if he might have found out during the uh, in the research he did for for uh, for tune in i wonder if he might have found out more of the material that they did during that last star club engagement mm -hmm. so, well the first chapter all these years ends at the very end of 1962 yeah, exactly so so we would have known something i think by now right. mm -hmm. since he released the book yeah but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't reference that, and there's never been a an updating of uh, of the Beatles live. Although or I should actually I shouldn't say that because the complete Beatles Chronicle was kind of an updating of it. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Unfortunately, we have to cut this program short because we lost Darren's signal in this wonderful thing called Skype. And we tried bringing him back, but it didn't work. So, if you would like to get in touch with us and comment on this show or any of our past shows, or if you want to pass along an idea for a topic for a future show, our email address is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. And if you could, please friend us on Facebook on our Things We Said Today page. And a reminder that if you would like to listen to one of the interviews I did with music industry veteran and engineer for John Lennon for his albums in the 70s, Dennis Ferrante, you can find it on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And our next show will resume this topic of our favorite solo Beatle albums, and we'll tackle Paul and George for that show, and hopefully have Darren back for that one. So, for Al Sussman, Alan Cozen, Steve Marinucci, and Darren DeVivo, this is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening, God bless Dennis Ferrante, and we'll see you next time.